stay on these traditional lands. In a place called Toronto, which means where there are tall trees standing in the water. And there has never been a time in our history when First Nations children needed you to stand taller than at this moment. Than at this moment. The crisis is not behind us, it is with us. And the opportunity to do something different than what was done in the past is lies with each one of you. Lies with each one of you. Children sing O Canada the loudest because they know what it means. When they sing that line, O Canada, we stand on guard for thee, they know it means more than wearing a poppy on November 11th. They know it means standing up for things that aren't fair. You teach them that in your work. Don't allow other children to be bullied. Make sure that everyone feels like they're a part. Make sure that everyone shares. And we all know that when you fight, everybody loses. Everybody loses. There's lots of talk about reconciliation now. And what I'm about to share with you is that it's First Nations and non-Aboriginal children who are showing us how it's done. Because we as adults, we sometimes, as we grow older, we make things too complicated. We make things too polite. We like to talk about Aboriginal peoples as if we're complex. And that, by the way, ladies and gentlemen, is code for we're not going to do anything about it. At least not for the next couple of years. This is Sheila Fraser. You all know her well. One of the most respected Auditor Generals of our time. And I'm particularly proud that she was a woman Auditor General as well in Ottawa. Probably the most powerful person in Ottawa. The Prime Minister always thinks they're powerful, but this woman's reports brought down a couple of governments in her time because of her honesty and her integrity. Well, she confirms to us what we have known for many years and what my friend Brenda Cope has said many times, is that Canada builds two bridges for children. Each goes over a very fast-running river. The bridge for non-Aboriginal children is not as strong as a wealthy country like ours can make. But thankfully, despite all of the odds, most children make it over to the other side and live the life of their dreams. And then there's the bridge that Canada builds for First Nations children. And as Sheila Fraser confirmed, and many others have written, the governments of Canada and the provincial and territorial governments underfund all the services on reserve. And how has that happened? Well, provincial child welfare, education, and health laws apply on reserve, but the federal government is supposed to fund it. And as Sheila Fraser will tell you, the federal government often falls up far short on the funding. And the provinces don't top it up. And so what we have is a two-tiered system. A bridge that only goes often two-thirds or half of the way over the river. And as First Nations children are falling into the rapids of high suicide rates, of high dropout rates, of overrepresentation in child welfare and in the jails, and First Nations peoples and our many non-Aboriginal allies and experts like Sheila Fraser and many others are calling out to the government to say you must build a bridge of equality. The government looks back to us and says, why aren't you thankful for the two-thirds of the bridge we built? We just gave you another $10 million. We're happy to say that that's what we're doing. But ladies and gentlemen, I hope that you will agree with me that there is no excuse in this country, this wealthy country, for racial discrimination against children in government services is not a legitimate fiscal restraint measure. Equality is the floor, it is not a seal. It is not a seal. And the problem with these drop-in-the-bucket approaches is that they've been going on for a long time. Here's a report, it says, taking into account the, Ontario, the Indian question, can Ontario afford to wait this, uh, uh, this period of time, this glacial change? This glacial change. What can anyone hazard a guess, he says. Can anyone hazard a guess as to what year, what decade, or what century children will be treated with equality? That was written in 1967. We are still waiting. 
We are still waiting. That crossed across two centuries, across five decades. And as the chairman of the Committee on the Elimination of Racial Discrimination asked Canada just last week, when is equality coming? When is it going to be? You talk about what you're doing as an incremental approach, or we're going to aspire to these goals, but when is it coming? And the reason it's so important to ask that question is because children only have one child. And as these political and jurisdictional chips get fired across the tables between the provinces and the federal government, it's children whose lives are affected. Maybe it is because sometimes in those beautiful office buildings and those places where people, good people, are trying to do their very best that they lose sight of the children. Maybe that's why it's taken the decades and the centuries that Sims had talked about in 1967. This is Shannon Kustach. She is one of those girls I talked about who is changing the world for the better. She is born in Attawapiskat First Nation. To Andrew Kustachin and Jenny Nackin. She was raised with the seven traditional teachings in a family with her older sister and four other brothers and sisters. Her first language is Cree. And her second language is English. And we all know from UNESCO, when children learn their own indigenous language first, or the mother tongue of their parents, they, they're not only more literate in that language, but they pick up second and third languages much better. And that was true of Shannon as well. But she was one of those children that was so looking forward to going to school. You've seen them all, maybe in your own families. Those weeks before kindergarten, when they have their first new school supplies, when they're rearranging them in 500 different ways, taking every crayon out of the box to check and make sure that it's in perfect shape for that first day of school. Well, that was Shannon for sure. Even back then, she had big dreams of going on to university. And uh, the first day of first school, though, she walked into a trailer, not a proper school. Because the only school in her community was closed in that year because it was sitting atop 30,000 gallons of toxic diesel fuel. Why? The government of Canada put a heating pipe underneath the school, and this is Mushkeg country where there's a lot of frost heating. And over a period of 20 years, that fuel seeped into the ground and contaminated. The children for many years, many decades, same with the staff, would be talking about the headaches that they would get, how nauseous they would feel. The government of Canada said there's no problem there, until finally there was an environmental health assessment that classified it as a class one toxic waste dump. But the world, as they, many schools and many of us, were fundraising for schools in Africa, no one was thinking about the children in Ottawa. And the, kids, the CBC did a documentary called The Forgotten Children of Ottawa, because the government of Canada brings up portable trailers as a temporary school, they say, and they put it on the playground of this contaminated site. So the place where this beautiful five-year-old and the other five-year-olds in her community were starting kindergarten, was no further from me to that back wall from the contaminated site separated only by a chain link fence. Now, I don't know if any of you are geologists, I'm certainly not, but I spent my fair share of my childhood in the sandbox. And I understand that when you drop in some liquid, a chain link fence is not going to keep that kind of contamination away from the children. But Shannon had high hopes. She believed that when leaders made a promise to children, that they would keep it. She believed when politicians made a promise to children, that they would keep it. It's only as we get older that we start to accept broken promises as a matter of course from our governments. But I think any of us here would agree. Though governments break or change promises, the ones they should never break are the ones they make for children. Three ministers of Indian Affairs across two different political parties promised these children a new school and did not deliver. But the children did not remain sound. Serena Kustachin, Shannon's older sister, was part of a group of youth in that community who would organize all the younger children to do protest posters. They thought these people must be breaking their promises because they don't understand how bad it is down in Attawapiska. It's not because they're bad people. But they just don't understand what it's like 
going to school in these portables, which are now so run down that it's often 20 below zero in the classroom because the heating goes off. Your hands are so cold you can't hold on to a pencil. They don't understand what it's, trying, what it's like to try and learn about the world when the Department of Indian Affairs provides no funding for any schools for libraries and no funding for computers. They don't understand, they thought, what it's like trying to eat your lunch but knowing you have to guard it from the mice because if you leave it in a cubby hole, there's so many gaps in these trailers that are now so warped that the mice will get to your sandwich before you do. And so they did these posters and they wrote letters. And the governments would announce another promise and they broke it. So when Shannon was in grade eight, she saw children dropping out of school as early as grade five. And meanwhile, we had the parliamentary budget officer and we had the Auditor General writing report after report about the inequalities on First Nations Reserve and education. Even if you're in a community with a good school, you are underfunded by two to $3,000 per student per year, starting at kindergarten. Is it any wonder that only 40% of First Nations children graduate from high school? There is a relationship between discrimination, inequality, and the inability to realize your dreams. Parliamentary Budget Officer also told us this. He said, you know, there are, Ottawa Piscot is only but one example. There's a school in Manitoba where the teachers at the beginning of the year have to bring the kindergarten kids aside, outside in the playground, and get them all prepared for something very special that happens in that school. You see, it's infested with snakes. And they come up the toilets. So if the children go into the bathroom and a snake comes up, they're very scared to go to the bathroom for the rest of the year. I think if any of us walked into the hotel bathroom and that happened, uh, there would be a big exodus out of here. There are schools that are often contaminated with black mold. And sadly, there are 50 communities where there are no schools at all. Where children as young as five years old are sent hundreds of miles away from their family just to get an education in the wealthiest country in the world, in a country where we can afford to spend $1.2 billion hosting the other eight richest countries in the world, we're asking children to wait. We're asking children to wait. We're doing what we can. We, make, we say all kinds of things to make ourselves feel better, but their reality remains unchanged. So Shannon Kuskatchen, she takes over her sister's leadership role and she organizes all of the other kids to write letters, and they did. And Minister Chuck Stroll then writes a letter back saying we cannot afford a school for your Adewapiskat. Now this, uh, these kids live in a remote community. How many other people here grew up in remote communities along with me? All right, now we have to start a movement here for those of you who live in the cities. How many people plan summer camps for kids? All right, we from remote communities, now, now ladies and gentlemen who come from remote and rural areas, you're gonna be with me on this one. We do not wanna to go to camp. <laughs> Am I right? Yeah, yeah. right? We wanna to go to the mall. We wanna to go to the movie theater. We wanna eat junk food at McDonald's restaurants. This is what we kids from remote and rural areas wanna do. And so add that onto your repertoire. Because we live in a camp, we see more wolves in a week than you will in your lifetime. <laughs> and that was the same with the true uh, the kids of Adamapas Gap, because along with writing all these letters, they were planning their grade eight graduation and they had raised enough money to go to Niagara Falls. But when they received that letter, the 13-year-olds all by themselves held a meeting. They said, yeah, we've raised all this money and we really wanna go see those things. But it's really more important that the younger children get a school. So we're going to cancel our grade 8 graduation trip. And we're going to use that money to send three children down to meet with Minister Strahl and ask for a new school. An airline ticket to Attawapiskat return is $3,000. So when people say, why don't you just move? I'd like to see how many here are in a position to buy a $3,000 ticket today. There's something else that's important for you to know. We often hear arguments about remoteness. Well, you are only remote in Canada unless the provinces, territories, or the federal government find a strategic military position, diamonds, oil, 
or minerals under your soil. And let me tell you, they will move heaven and earth to make sure that they can extract those natural resources. And we have even spent, I don't know how many billion on a bunch of fighter jets to patrol sovereignty in the north when they haven't cared about the north in the last 50 years. But our greatest natural resource children, they get left behind. They get left behind. So Shannon Kustachin ends up in the front office of Minister Stroll, then a conservative government. And as she would say in the Globe and Mail quote in a week later, I think he was nervous. <laughs> Politicians prepare for a lot of things. They know how to deal with NGO leaders like myself, but they don't know how to deal with 13-year-olds. And the minister points out how nice his office is, and it is very nice. I've been there once, and it's uh, right on the Ottawa River. And well, this 13-year-old, she looks around, and she sees all the art, but she feels warm. She sees all the office supplies and all the people outside, and she said, yes, minister, this is really nice. I wish it was this nice for us trying to learn up and out of Wapiska. <laughs> well, the minister starts looking at his watch. Ministers are busy people. They have lots of important things to do. And he says, I'm sorry, I don't have much more time for you. I'm sorry you don't have much more time for you. I wonder if he thought about how much effort it took for those 13-year-olds to come all that way. And what it must have felt like to hear, well, I don't have that much more time for you. He was a good man, but he wasn't thinking. Shannon Kustachin says, are you going to give us a new school or not? And the minister said, no, we can't afford it. And what does this 13-year-old do? What would have many of you done? You would have said, well, can we work towards the next budget? You would have rationalized that inequality, and you would have somehow tried to get what you can get. But for Shannon, there is no reason why any child should get less than what all other children receive. And so she rose to the minister in indignity and elegance. She said, minister, thank you for meeting with us today. But I don't believe it. And I will never give up. Because school is a time for dreams and every child deserves this. She walked out of his office, and this is Shannon Kustachin two hours after that meeting. She was standing on the House of Parliament with a piece of paper in her hands. She was practicing what she was about to tell the world. Her hands were shaking so badly that you could hear the paper moving. And she was quietly in her own voice saying the words that eventually she would say. An event, the microphone is passed to her. She never grew up wanting to be an activist for First Nations education. But that's what she had become. And she stands up in front of Parliament and she says this. I will never give up. School is a time for dreams, and every kid deserves it. And she was good as her work. She was 13 years old. She had to move hundreds of miles away from her community just to go to high school, because her own high school and her community is so underfunded that she would grow, graduate two to three years behind what all other Canadian students would get and would never be able to grow up to be a lawyer, which was a dream of her life. So there she was in New Liskert. You can imagine, those of you who have 13-year-olds, I have an 18-year-old in my house, and I'm not sure he's ready to leave home yet. At least I'm not ready for him to leave home. But there she was at the airport, having to leave her lovely family to go to school. It was the first time in her life that she'd ever stood in a hallway of a school. That basic thing that all of us have experienced was the first time for her. And she was there with Charlie Angus, and they were walking down the hallway and about to talk to other students about what it was like to go to school in these conditions. Because by this time, Shannon had learned about the children in Manitoba with the snakes, the children in BC with the uh, black mole contamination, the children in Alberta who miss 22 days a year because the school runs out of water. And she knew this was bigger than out of water sky. But soon, as some of us know this as parents, you find yourself thinking you're walking with a kid and they are no longer there. We've all done it. And Charlie walks back to find her. 
and there she is in the classroom. And she's picking up all of the things that are in a classroom. This is a rundown school, not one of the best ones that you would see in your neighborhoods. And she's touching all of the papers. And she's looking up at the wall at all of the posters. And there are tears coming down her eyes. She cannot stop crying. And Charlie said, what's wrong, Shannon? And she says, oh, Charlie, I wish I had my life to live over again so I could go to a school as nice as this. A couple months later, Shannon was one of 45 children in the world to be nominated for the International Children's Peace Prize given out by the Nobel laureates. And only a few short months after that, she tragically died in a car accident hundreds of miles away from her family. But not before she reached out to non-Aboriginal children and asked them to join the letter writing campaign to make sure every First Nations child had a school and thousands of them replied. She told me, she said, when I sent out the YouTube video, I wasn't sure anyone would answer. We've all held parties or conferences and you send out the invites and you wonder if anyone will come, but can you imagine if you're sending out an invite to wonder if anyone really cares about you? And thousands of them answered. Well, within 24 hours of her passing, the many friends and family and the thousands of non-Aboriginal children she inspired created a Facebook page called Shannon's Dream. It was to memorialize their friend and their hero, but it was also to do something more than that, and that was to continue her work. If Shannon would never give up, neither would they. And they all said, when Shannon wrote to the International Prize Committee, she said, the one thing I hate is broken promises. The one thing I hate is broken promises. So these are the children, and this is how they're continuing her work. Now, I find myself uh, at Lady Evelyn School in Ottawa on April 27, 2011, with Shannon's mom and dad. And there, I walk into the school, and there's all these beautiful blue flowers, which is Shannon's favorite flower. It was eloquently, and perhaps a little bit in the spirit, I forget me. And there are children walking all over wearing these forget-me-not buttons, and you can find some outside for yourselves as well. And they had built a school out of paper mache, and you can see it there. And it was sitting on a radio flyer wagon. And I asked some of the girls, they were about 10 years old, I said, why did you build this school? And they said, well, we read Canadian Geographic. And we realized that in the 10 years they've been waiting for the school in Attawapiskat, they built 75 schools in Afghanistan. Something we should do, but it makes us wonder why they didn't build this one. So we thought maybe it's because the government doesn't know how to build schools in Canada. <laughs> so we thought we would show them how it's done. And uh, the, the girl said, this is, it's not that hard. We did this in an afternoon. <laughs> now, so... This is right, of course, during the federal election campaign, and as you can see here, that little boy is wearing orange, but it's not for the New Democratic Party. The one in blue is not wearing it for the Conservatives, and the one in red is not wearing it for the Liberals. They are all standing on guard for fairness. They found themselves marching towards Parliament Hill, and uh, I can't speak for politicians because I've never been elected to anything, even in student council, but I believe this much to be true. There's only one thing that scares politicians more than a kid with a sign. And that is a kid with a sign and a microphone. <laughs> there's lots of protesters up on Parliament Hill, but there's not very many that are as cute as these. So they tend to garner a lot of attention. And they're standing up in Parliament Hill and they have something to tell the country. Up steps a little boy and he tells me later, he said, Cindy, I didn't know if anyone would even read my letter. A lot of adults don't listen to kids, Harry said. But I decided to write it anyway, and this is what he says. He's standing up there. You can imagine Stephen Harper's office overlooks Parliament Hill. I'm sure all the pundits and strategists were talking about what all the other parties were doing, but there was Harry standing there with the microphone. He said, dear Stephen Harper, do you have a cap? I have a cat. His name is Micah, and he's a boy, and he's black. So this boy is the perfect kid for an elevator, right? He's polite. He knows how to make conversation. And of course, we know Stephen Harper has lots of cats, 
Because that's one of the things he and his wife like to support. It's a good thing. But then Harry gets down to business. He says, Stephen Harper, listen to me. If you do not build more schools, you're going to create a crime wave and lose all of your money. Because kids who cannot get a school cannot get jobs. And they're still going to need money when they grow up. So some of them are going to have to steal. And then people in the community are going to get mad because crooks are invading their homes. And since you're in charge, you're going to have to fix this mess. So do the right thing, build more schools, man up, love, Harry. <laughs> now, the Prime Minister and the members of Parliament received many of these types of messages. And the children, they wondered if they, anyone was heard. But they were not giving up. It was just one phase in the story. And they were beginning to understand that the inequalities in education were just one way that First Nations children experience them. You see, there's a whole multiplier effect across every service that piles up these inequalities on the hopes and dreams of children. This is Jordan River Anderson. He's from Norway House Cree Nation, and he was five years old. He didn't grow up wanting to be a poster boy for the inequalities of First Nations children. He just wanted to grow up. He was born with complex medical needs to Ernest and Virginia Anderson, and for the first two years of his life, he had to remain in hospital. That in itself is traumatic enough for any family. We all know what it's like when you're bringing a baby home. Some of us get upset when you have to stay at hospital even for a day or so after you give birth, because now basically you give birth and you're out the door, right ladies? So, uh, and, uh, but waiting two years and with a child who's critically ill is very difficult, especially for a family that where dad had to go back up to Norway House to care for the other children, while mom stayed with Jordan, so they were separated. Now, the dad and the community, they worked so that every service was available for Jordan. This was not a question that the service wasn't there. It absolutely was there. And finally, at the age of two, doctor said he could go home. Doctors were thrilled with the service plan, Everything was ready. And if Jordan was a non-Aboriginal child, he would have gone home. But because he's First Nations, the Manitoba government said, good plan and even better because we don't have to pay because he's a First Nations child. That means the federal government pays because they pay for things on reserve. The federal government said, oh, hang on here. Well, we're not completely sure we should pick up those provincial costs. And even if we should, there's about 20, 30 departments in Ottawa, and we're not sure who has authorities to pay for his at-home care. A government recently said it served, one of the representatives, the best interest of children is the guiding mark of their decision-making. But I think Jordan would say otherwise. Good people decided to put their jurisdictional interests ahead. It's easy to do. It happens all the time. We reframe discrimination and so that another moral good takes its place, like we're not going to pick up a provincial cost or a federal cost. Meanwhile, the children themselves, they continue to experience this horror. You see, every other toddler's life is really measured by their first jump in a mud puddle. The first time that they have put both arms around the neck of a big hairy dog. That first snowman, that first birthday party, the creating the spaghetti mess all over the kitchen. But for Jordan, his life was done by nursing shift changes at 7 o'clock in the morning and 7 o'clock in the evening. Because the government bureaucrats decided the way to resolve this was to leave this baby in the hospital while they argued over who should pay. They had what they call case conferences. We're meeting as much as we can, they told the parents, who were desperate to see their baby come home. And when that didn't work, the doctors chimed in. The doctor said, we as medical professionals are writing to you and telling you that a hospital is no place for a baby to grow up in. Government said, we're doing the best we can, we're moving forward. And what was happening for Jordan? Well, he saw seasons change outside of his hospital window. Other little boys would come into the office, into his uh, room, they would get better, and they would go home. And they would tell him what life is like beyond the hospital glass. 
I have videos of Jordan where he's playing with the computer and he's playing on the drum just waiting. Waiting for someone to do the right thing for him. Waiting for what Canada said it would do, which is act in his best interest. Waiting for Manitoba to do what it said it would do, and that is to act in its best interest. A year ago, I met one of Jordan's nurses. She said, I want to tell you all here that I was there when the code blue was called. I saw that baby die in a hospital because of who he was. If he was a non-Aboriginal child, he would have at least had three years of quality life outside. But because he was First Nations and for no other reason, it somehow made it okay for him to die in a hospital. What did his family do? They could have sued both levels of government. But they chose not to do that. They wanted to use Jordan's memory in the best way possible. They created Jordan's principle. And it says this. Where a government service is available to all other children, and one of these crazy payment disputes crops up, the government at first contact pays for the service and argues about it later. It is consistent with Canadian law under Section 15 of the Charter. It passes unanimously through the House of Commons in 2007, and the province of Ontario adopted it, but in a narrower form. It said it doesn't apply in education. And we know that to be true, because when they rolled out all-day kindergarten in this province, they did so for every child except for First Nations kids on reserve. And for me, that is wrong. We should not accept that kind of legitimization by either level of government. Their primary responsibility is to stand on guard for the values that define this country the most. And if we can afford fighter jets, if we can afford pagodas, if we can afford submarines, trying to keep submarines afloat, we certainly can afford to provide every child a chance for equality in this country in 2012. I wonder, as I wondered, if the Government of Canada even knows about this. This is access to the information document. This is an internal document in Canada. And you can see, although we've not found situations where the federal government has been found liable, notice that's our first concern. Because of child fatalities or critical incidents related to failure to provide necessary care, we believe they exist, and unless solutions are found, they will continue to occur. This is your government. And this is what they're saying on the inside. And a briefing note to the Deputy Minister. Now, the government of Canada narrowed Jordan's principle to only apply to children with complex medical needs and multiple service providers. They did that narrowing without talking to Jordan's family. They did that narrowing without any explanation as to why this type of jurisdictional dispute and the inequality it results from it is somehow okay in other areas of children's services. But Marina Beadle will tell you that they're not even implementing it at that level. Now, this is Marina Beadle. She's in Picto Landing First Nation in Nova Scotia. And she is an elder, as you can plainly see. She has two sons. One is Jonathan, he's age 20, and this is Jeremy. Now, if Marina were here, she would tell you, first of all, that Jeremy loves music. He just seems to come alive whenever there's the powwow drum or a song on the radio. And he loves art, too. He's one of those gifts and kids whose just gifts come from the spirit in those wonderful artistic ways that words can never reach us. But what is equally true is he was born with hydrocephalus, which led to severe cerebral palsy and autism. The autism is so severe that it creates self-harming behaviors, especially in unpredictable situations. And Jeremy, thank heaven for the creator's strength, has outlived his life expectancy. Now, Marina parents him for the first 15 years of her life with almost no supports because Unlike parents with children with disabilities off reserve who don't, don't receive what they need, you even get far less on reserve. She told me that she said, I've always slept lightly, Cindy. I don't, want, I don't want to sleep deeply because I want to hear Jeremy if he ever needs me. I want to hear Jeremy if he ever needs me. And those of you who are mothers in this audience, you know what that means. When, Mer when Jeremy was 15, Marina had a double stroke. So severe that she could not walk and could not hold a water glass. And when she woke up, her first thought wasn't, oh my gosh, I can't walk. 
It's, oh my gosh, when Jeremy says he needs me, I won't be able to help. But she knew about Jordan's principle. And she had talked to families off reserve and knew that they had gotten support in these circumstances. There's a base amount and there's an exceptional circumstances amount and Jeremy uh, qualified for both. So she was confident because the government said they promised us that they would do the right thing, but they didn't. Canada said, okay, we'll give you the base amount, but that's inadequate for Jeremy's care for him to be safely at home. We're not going to give you the exceptional circumstances amount. Well, what does that leave Marina? She leaves her in a situation where if her child's at home, he may be in danger because he's not getting the level of care that he needs. But Canada is a compassionate country. It says, oh, no, we got another option for you if you don't like option B, A. And that is, we'll put him in institutional care, <coughs> hundreds of miles away from his community, and we'll pay whatever that costs. How many people here, if you're Marina Beadle, would take the inadequate level of care while you're at home to care for Jeremy? Any volunteers? Think that's a good idea? How many here would take, let's place my child who's already exceeded his life expectancy and goes to self-harming behavior in unpredictable situations in an institution? How many people here as taxpayers think it was a good decision for Canada to provide the inadequate level of care at home and be willing to pay top dollar for an institution? I think that sometimes our governments underestimate the goodwill of Canadians. They certainly did in this case. Well, what does Marina Beadle do? She decides on top of everything else she's doing, she's going to take the federal government to court for failure to implement Jordan's principle. And on June 11, 2012 in Halifax, we will have a legal precedent set on whether Jordan's principle becomes law in this country. And it's sad to me that it needs to become a law because it should just be a part of moral consciousness. But thanks to Marina and many others, that is starting to happen. And what about children in child welfare care? Well, as you sit here, there are more First Nations children in foster care than there was at the Haida residential schools. And I will tell you that I believe it's completely preventable in most cases. If two things happen. One is that child welfare and I was a child welfare worker for over a decade on the line, is child welfare uh, codifies all kinds of things as personal deficits. It's one of its biggest weaknesses. And what is the problem with that? Well, I'm all for holding parents' feet to the fire for things that they can change. But child welfare actually holds parents' feet to the fire for things that they can't change. And let me tell you what that means. First Nations children are not in child welfare care because of overrepresentation of abuse. It's neglect. But what is neglect? As I told you, I was a child welfare worker. I worked in a First Nation. I worked in a downtown east side, and I worked in one of the wealthiest neighborhoods called the British Properties in Vancouver. I did it for over 12 years, and I don't know, maybe I'm a slow learner, but I wouldn't really ever figure out what neglect was. What the Canadian Incident Study on Reported Child Abuse and Neglect tells us is that the factors driving First Nations children at these record levels are poverty, poor housing, and caregiver substance misuse. Now, caregiver substance misuse is linked to the whole history of residential schools and the multiple traumas. It is a personal responsibility for change. But like many other things on reserve, there's almost no money for addiction services on reserve to prevent it or respond to it. When I go see child welfare workers all over the world, I will ask them, how many people here, and let's try it here, how many people here have had more than a day's training on poverty? and what you can do about it to be able to mediate that as a factor in the children's experience. How many people here have had more than a day's training on substance misuse, its impacts on parenting, and what you can do about it? Every person working in this field should have that training. And what we do is we codify it as a personal deficit. So I'll come into your home, Let's just say, for the sake of argument, you're in Attawapiskat. This table's in Attawapiskat. Some of you are living in tents. You actually have a home, but you have two buckets. One for water, which is the one source of potable water, one for sewer. You have a home, but you have 29 other people living with you. Because when the sewer backup happened, there is no homeless shelter, and you're a generous person, so you allowed everybody to live with you. I come in as a child welfare worker and I'm saying, you know what, things are not, you, you are not doing what you can for your kids. Your kids are looking pretty dirty. 
you know, uh, all you have to do is go over and get another bucket of water and throw it into the washing machine and you would have, oh, you don't have a washing machine. Well, you know, you're going to do what you can, right? Now, what I'm going to say is, and some of you will have substance misuse issues, but what am I going to do when I diagnose you with, with neglect or I say that that's your issue? I'm going to give you parenting class. Now, how many people here have watched Nanny 911? Okay, how many poor, drug-addicted homes has she been into? <laughs> you know, I personally, and I'm not the most experienced in the world, but I could turn around a rich, upper-middle-class family and their parenting screw-ups in like a week or so. If I was an elder, I could probably do it in an afternoon. But I need some extra time, right? Now, if I came into the same group and I said, look, I'm going to work with all of you because the one thing I really want to share with you is that you do have a responsibility to provide better care, but I suspect you all know that. And I suspect you want to do better. So let's figure out a way to give you all water in your houses. Let's figure out a way to find a place where you actually can buy something from the Northern store where Cheese Whiz is not $23.99. Let's figure out a different way of parenting. If we did that in child welfare, we would be substantially better off. What we're doing is almost, I wrote an article recently called The Emperor's New Clothes. Because Hans Christian Andersen has said that, where we, there's the emperor, of course, walking down the street, and the, only the affluent are supposed to see his new robes. And of course, it's a child who points out that the guy is stark naked. And child welfare is walking along an increased irrelevancy to the children and the families we serve because we think that poverty, substance misuse, and poor housing are beyond our experience. And I think that's fundamentally wrong and irresponsible. So we need to target those issues. But in order to target them, we need equitable funding on reserve. And as we have known for over 10 years, the funding provided for on reserve child welfare is far less than what others receive. This again is an access to information document, one of the many available online, that shows how dire, in Canada's word, the situation is. As a result of underfunding prevention services, they know it's driving children into care. The 2007 fact sheet that used to be on their website, which is now no longer on their website, because I filed it as evidence against them in court. Um, <laughs> it's amazing how that can happen. Huh? Facts almost disappear when that happens. You file a court document and these things go away. But you can see they're all worried about getting civil proceedings launched against them as a result of what's happening to these kids in care. Now, we worked for over 10 years with the government, sitting around the table, documenting the inequality, documenting the harmful impacts for kids in child welfare, and creating two solutions. The second one, by over 20 leading experts, including five economists. We had over 100 pages of economic spreadsheets documenting down to the last penny how we'd spend this money. It would have cost half a percent of the surplus budget to do the right thing, and Canada walked away from it. So what do you do? We're a four-person organization, the Caring Society. We had a rundown office overlooking Scotty's bomb shop and exotic lingerie. <laughs> and every day I would walk by the towers of the buildings of Canada, including the Justice We had $50,000 in the bank for my keynote monies, which I donated. And we were receiving some federal funding at the time, although only about 30% of our budget, 25-30% of our budget. But we had this little inkling. You see, there's this thing called democracy in Canada, but the real test of it is, is if your democratic views are against the government, do they continue to support democracy? And uh, we decided that we're going to have to uh, go all in on this one. So we filed, along with the Assembly of First Nations, a human rights complaint against Canada in 2007 alleging that they're racially discriminating against children in child welfare by underfunding First Nations children on reserves. Within 30 days of filing that, somehow our core funding from the federal government was reprofiled for other purposes. So in this day, we're actually the only national Aboriginal organization that gets no government money. But we're still here. And one of the reasons for that, or I thought that things would be okay, I wondered how are we going to pay the rent for this rundown office and how are we going to pay the staff. And then an envelope arrived in the mail, and it was one of those crumply envelopes. And it shook when you held on to it. And I opened up the envelope, and inside it said, Dear Cindy, here's some M-U-N-Y for the kids. 
Love, Ellen. And inside, I looked at the envelope, it was $1.67 out of her piggy bank. And somehow I knew we would be okay. We did something else with the court case. We put all the documents online and we asked caring Canadians not to agree with us, but simply to follow them. To listen and watch Canada carefully. To listen and watch us as First Nations carefully and make up your own mind as to whether you think in 2012 Canada is doing the right thing. And if you read all those documents, you'll find out this, that Canada is not arguing it on the merits. And that is an important thing. They are not prepared to talk about whether they're actually discriminating against children. Because even if they get rid of their own documents, what are they going to do with Sheila Fraser and all the rest of these reports? No, no, no. They have more important concerns that they want to talk to us all about. They're saying, no, don't listen to Cindy Blackstock. The real question is not our inequality. The real question of importance to Canadians is we as the federal government only fund these people on reserve. The provinces fund these people off reserve. Even though the same law applies, let's just forget about that. They don't like to talk about that either. You cannot compare these two service providers. That's not right. It's not fair to us as a government. It's called the comparator argument. And now here's argument, now they've got a backup plan, in case you're not convinced by that one. They said, we as the government, we don't deliver the services. What I do is I give these ladies some money. You have an agency, and you're servicing this table here. These ladies have some money from the province, and you're servicing this table here. Now you guys are neighbors, there's only this imaginary line between you. But you're looking over there, and you're saying, hey, they're getting more than what I'm getting. So you filed a discrimination complaint against the agents. Canada is saying that is who's responsible. Not us as the funder. Now, I don't know, maybe I'm a simple girl. Sometimes it takes me a while to understand things, but I would think the party that's discriminating is the one that has the power to remedy it. And this table would not have the power to remedy it because you probably agree that you're providing a lower level of service. It's the federal government who is. Now, we were in, uh, Canada has dragged this thing out, and we were in federal court on February 14th. But there are now so many children watching this case that we have to have the hearings at the Supreme Court of Canada build. We had over 200 people there every day. Can you imagine yourselves being the government of Canada and having a whole courtroom full of children? It's enough to be badly behaved as a government ahead of, in front of adults, but in front of kids, maybe they wonder if the kids can understand all this legal mumbo jumbo. Well, I went out during the break, and there was uh, a bunch of uh, kids, and they were about seven years old. And they say, uh, one of them flags me over, Cindy! They were eating their snacks. And he took his job of being a witness seriously. He had a little reporter's notebook. <laughs> yeah. And he says, I said, so how's it going? And he says, oh, it's going good. He says, let me show you what I'm doing. So he has this little notepad, and you know the one, two, three, four slashes and then a one across for counting? So he had it in two channels. There was a big line down the page, and one side had a long list of those. And the other side was only about half as long. And so I said, well, can you tell me about this? He said, well, the long side is when the judge is asking the Canadian government a question. And the short side is when they're answering. <laughs> Another little girl, she was in kindergarten. She was in kindergarten. And she had sat there for half a day. Imagine that, a kindergarten. And the other kindergarten kids had sat there for the same period of time. So I come out and I talk to the kids, and the kids want to say something to me. And this one little girl said, why are they talking about everything except for the children? It's a good question, isn't it? And one little boy said to me as I was about to, uh, you go to the Supreme Court, there's this middle area where the children can sit and have lunch. Usually it's adults sitting there and having lunch. And then the men's room and the ladies' room are to the left and right. And I'm about to go into the ladies' room and he says, Cindy, stop. He said, there's marble in there. This place is very fancy. <laughs> very fancy. And what about teenagers? 
Well, in one of the very first court hearings that I was at, I was on the stand being cross-examined by Canada's lawyers, which, by the way, are the residential school lawyers, the same lawyers that fought against residential school survivors are now on this case. And the one cross-examined me, uh, interestingly enough, had actually argued against residential school survivors from my own community in British Columbia. I'm on the stand for the first time. <coughs> I'm being cross-examined, and behind me are all these students from alternate school. And as this one young man said to me, he said, we're from alternate school, which means we get into trouble a lot. And he said, sometimes we deserve it, but a lot of times it's the system that deserves to be in trouble. And you are getting the system in trouble, and you want our help. That's why we're all here. So I'm in the background, and um, I'm on the stand, and the, among the first questions Canada asked me, and this is really true, you can listen, read the transcript online. Dr. Blackstock, do you believe in God? To which I answer, as far as I know, Mr. Taylor, under Canadian law, you can choose to affirm or to swear. And that a belief in God is not a prerequisite to telling the truth. But if you can produce some Canadian law that says that every witness on a Canadian judicial hearing has to say that they believe in God, then I'd be happy to read it. And he backtracks. Second question is, Dr. Blackstock, were you in child welfare care when you were a child? I can hear the youth gasping in the back. And before I can answer, my lawyer objects. <coughs> and then uh, so he says, you're not asking her if she was in child welfare care when she was a child. Oh, yes, that's, uh, well, no, 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 that's not what I meant at all. And he backs out his tape. And he's got this big manila envelope with black markers saying Cindy Blackstock on the front. And I'm looking over the witness stand, and I'm thinking, I didn't know I lived that kind of a spicy life, you know? I'm like, <laughs> I, I, you know, what's in there, kind of, you know? He's flipping through it, and he says, oh, you got a bachelor's degree at UBC, and then you did this, and you got a PhD from U Toronto, and you did this. He says, um, Dr. Blackstock, were you in child welfare care when you were an adult? And I'm thinking, bring me another cup of coffee. It's going to be a long day. So I say, you can't be in child welfare care if you're an adult. Oh, no, no, that's not what I meant either. He's flipping through there, and he, he then makes more references to the amount of time that's passed in my life. And he says, uh, Dr. Blackstock, you've been an adult for some time, haven't you? <laughs> now, in the background, we have Summer. And this is what she wrote. This is not a kid who's had a lot of background in First Nations peoples, but kids can just see fairness. And this is what she says. She says, Canada's lawyer has to come up with a good reason as to why the tribunal should be dismissed. And really, there is no good reason except for the fact that the government is scared and doesn't want the justice to be done. It's no wonder the government doesn't want this to be public. It's embarrassing and sad to think that our government, our government, is trying to get out of its responsibility to provide the same quality of First Nations children as they do to non-Native children. This is February 14th. That same court case, we had children writing Valentines to their member of Parliament and to the Prime Minister about why it's so important that First Nations children have the same chance to grow up safely at home, be healthy, be proud of who they are, and go to good schools. And you can see there, there is about 600 children of every cultural and spiritual belief possible. They were doing what many members of Parliament have yet are still trying to embrace, and that is that they truly were standing on guard for the country. They see no difference between standing on guard for fairness of First Nations children and doing what's in the best interest of the country making the country proud. One little girl gets up on the microphone, they had a microphone again, and she says, Dear Stephen Harper, I think you should go back to grade five. <laughs> because that's where we learn about the Charter of Rights and Freedoms. That says that you can't treat people differently because of their race. And then another little guy, Elliot, gets up there, and he says, I don't know why we're, just, we're criticizing China when you're not even doing the right thing here back at home. You're not doing the right thing back at home. Well, the children also prepared a book, which I'm going to show to you in a minute. But the children are actually writing letters, and some people might say these children are being political. But they understand something important. That they're being citizens, and the person who can make that change is the Prime Minister. When I asked the kids, who does the Prime Minister do? He said, he's the person who's supposed to listen to the people and do what's best for all of us. He's the person who is supposed to listen to the people and do what's best for all of us. 
So I am not above stealing ideas from children. And uh, the children know that I've, I've stolen this idea from them. You remember that beautiful mailbox. Well, one of the things I'm going to ask you to do is sign on to Shannon's Dream, sign on to the I Am a Witness campaign, sign on to Jordan's Principle, and get children in your lives to do it as well. But I'm also going to ask you on June 11th to build your own mailbox. Because every walk needs a destination, and that's going to be your destination. And you're going to write your own letters to the government about a better Canada and how, where one where no child gets left behind because of who they are, where they're not told less, you get less because of your race. And then you're going to march those letters to your mailbox and you're going to register the number of walkers and letter writers. Now, people in early childhood centers, this is perfect for you. You can do a couple of rounds around your box and pictures matter. Pictures matter. I often think that children's pictures say a thousand words that adults don't have the courage to say. Some of you might still be thinking. I don't know, she's asked me to do three things, four things really. Three of them take under two minutes and are completely free. I can do them as a person in an organization, but you know what, I don't know if I would. It's not that simple. Inequality is not that simple. It is that simple, I think. Well, I want to tell you about Wesley Prankert. I'm going to guilt you into doing something. <laughs> Wesley is from Niagara Falls, he's 11 years old. And he hears about the conditions in Attawapiskat First Nation from his father who had just been. He could not believe that people are living in tents in 50 below zero weather. He could not believe that there's, there are one in six First Nations don't have clean water to drink. Including, by the way, First Nations an hour and a half away from Toronto. He could not believe that people are having to live in mold infested homes. And he could not believe that there's no friggin' playground in Abadawapiskat. He says to his dad, we have to do something. And in that moment, Bob Prankert's life changed forever. Two years later, on August of this year, Wesley Prankert was up in Attawapiskat building a playground with the children of Attawapiskat and the community members. But here's the rest of the story. He had raised the $90,000 to build that playground all on his own. Sitting across that table, he didn't know how to fundraise, but he thought, maybe what I'll do, because I am a cute kid, I'll go pitch a tent in the Niagara Falls playground, and then people can pledge dollars for how long I'm there, because if people in Attawapiskat can live in those conditions, maybe I can too for a weekend. And he raised $6,000. But then he decides to do something. I wish I'm going to hire Wesley, I think. <laughs> he comes in to our corporate office. And he says, I'm raising money for playgrounds in First Nations communities. Will you match dollar for dollar what I'm making? I'm sure, I don't know this to be true, but I suspect the CEO said, what's a couple of car washes? Right? <laughs> sure, we'll match it. And then Wesley Prankert enters and wins the Pepsi Refresh Project for $25,000. <laughs> so now Corporate Canada is up to its ears for at least $35,000. But here's the difference, Corporate Canada kept its promise. Now Wesley was concerned. There's real limitations to being a now 13-year-old, 12-year-old philanthropist. And that is that you have to go to school in September. So he was wanting all this playground equipment to make the barge up in Tadawapiskat over the summer so he could be there to play for it, with it, and to help build it. But the barge kept on being delayed and delayed and delayed for reasons he didn't understand. And he was getting so worried because he might have to go to school and he would miss the building of it. Well, finally the barge arrives and he's on the banks of the river and standing there with Jenny Nakagi and Andrew Kustachin, Shannon's mom and dad. And, and Wesley says, are you here for the playground? And he said, yes, we're all here for the playground. We're so thankful to you, Wesley, and the community had a big party to celebrate. He said, we're also here for something else. Something wonderful has just happened today, Wesley. In our tradition, we have a memorial for our daughter. And we were really worried because for, there, were, there was delays in, in her head stuff. And if the barge would have left on time, we would have had to wait a whole another year to have her ceremony. 
But from the blessings of the Creator, the barge kept on being delayed and delayed and delayed. And Shannon Kustachin came up on the same barge as the playground in Adamowski. She wanted to be there. Now, Wesley calls his group northernstarfish.org, and I hope you'll all donate to it. And you'll watch his videos. It's one of my favorite charities myself. I make a donation all the time to Wesley. But I'm a BC girl where we actually have starfish. And uh, those First Nations folks here from Ontario, you can disagree with me, but I have not seen a starfish here in Ontario. <laughs> so I finally had to warm up the uh, courage to ask Wesley the courageous question. Wesley, there are no starfish in Niagara Falls. And there are no starfish in Attawapiska. So why do you call yourself Northern Starfish Water? And he said, well, when I said I was going to do something, a lot of adults told me that I'm just a kid. Maybe just have a car wash or something. You can't do this. And then he says, my dad told me a story. He said, maybe you've heard it too. There is a beach where all kinds of starfish had washed up. A little boy comes upon it. And just as children naturally do, they don't judge. When, they, when Wesley walked into Attawapiska, he wasn't saying, what is the financial management of the community? What he saw were people in need of help, and he was going to get to it. He even outbeat the Red Cross up there. And of course, he outbeat our national government by a long straw. But the little boy is on the beach and he picks up the starfish and he's throwing them in one to one so that they might live. And then a man comes along and let's face it, ladies, it could have been a woman too. We do this too. We do this too. The man walks up to the child and says, what are you doing? Well, I'm putting the starfish back into the ocean, he says. Well, the adult, he looks down on the beach, and there's so many starfish, there's no way they can all be safe. He points this out to the child. That's what adults do, right? We're there to a little sober second thought. You are not going to be able to save all these starfish. Why bother? Shouldn't you be in school? Go play with your friends or something. Maybe call the environmental group, get them to do it. And the little boy, he looks down at that beach, and my gosh, there are a lot of starfish. And he is so small. But something wonderful about children is sometimes they will disagree with us. And despite all the logic that the man had thrown at him, he finds his knees bending. And he picks up a starfish and he throws it into the ocean, and he says, there, I just saved that one. That's why the children who have written this book I'm about to share with you are taking action. As many of you are sitting around wondering about the complexities, we'll have another meeting, we'll do all of this. The kids are not that patient. They understand that a moment in the life of a child can be that moment from when they're crawling to when they take that first step, to when they're in kindergarten, to that first day when they're in grade one from that time when they finally get how to do multiplication to their first birthday party. Children cannot wait 45 years for a call. And they can't wait for adults to do the right thing. And so they asked if I would share a book that they wrote called Children's Voices Have Power. And thanks to the Elementary Teachers Federation, we're hoping that a copy of this book will be in every elementary school in Ontario. And I'd like to introduce you to some of the authors.
I can see everything that you're trying to hide. Raise your hands if you're prepared in this generation, with all the courage and strength that you have, to stand with First Nations children. Raise your hands if you are prepared to stand with the non-Aboriginal children who know that fairness counts. And stand up if you are, for one moment, prepared to stand on guard for the values that define this country the most. This generation of children expects you to do better. You are the very best chance that they have. Be a witness. Be the change. Follow the example of the great children that we see in these videos. Thank you very much.